Michigan Liberation is a statewide network of people and organizations organizing to end the criminalization of black families and communities of color in Michigan. We envision a state without mass incarceration, mass policing, and punishment. We envision a state with the best public education in the nation, single-payer health care, and thriving black and brown communities. Here on the Respect the Rules podcast, we will lift up the stories and experiences of those impacted by mass incarceration, collective ties to the criminal legal system, and the frontline efforts to end mass incarceration. What's up, everybody? This is Miss Marjan, and welcome to another episode of Respect the Roots, Michigan Liberation's podcast. Today, we are still continuing our talk about mental health. It's May, Mental Health Month, all right? And my guest, I'm bringing on Damara West. Before I bring her on, I just have to say, this sister is a bad sister. This, oh man, she is covering so much, not only her own story, her own type of trauma, but she is advocating for others out there. So I want to go ahead and I don't want to leave her out no more longer. What's going on, Damara? What's happening? Hey, Miss Marjan. I am so, so, so grateful to be in sacred space with you, Queen. Yes. I, I got to read a little bit of your bio and everything. But the thing is, you are an author. And we're going to be talking about your book, Me Too, A Therapist's Journey to Heal, Find Liberation, and Joy. All right? Yeah. But you have a story to tell because before you became a therapist, it's almost like what we say at Michigan Liberation, those closest to the uh, problem are closest to the solution. Come on, come on. Say that again for the people in the back. <laughs> those closest <laughs> to the problem are closest to the solution, okay? That means that's probably what your, your calling is. And we got to start uh, recognizing it. And I'm so excited to have you on here because when you guys filled out the podcast for and I saw all the areas that you cover, like the impact of trauma and violence on the BIPOC communities, mm -hmm. the trauma and forward practices focused on BIPOC um, needs, the holistic healing, self-care, and, and just, oh my gosh, be well, beautiful people, incentives, and support. So you yeah. are tuning in the BIPOC um, community as far as it deals with mental health. But besides mm -hmm. being a therapist and and an author, you know, I mean, you are involved in yoga. Oh, you got to help me out. Was it how you say it? Ricky? Ricky? Ray. Yeah, Ricky. <laughs> Ricky Master. I know that's kind of like the how do you <laughs> that magic? Listen, hey. that's, that, that's that spiritual energy work, says. Yes, that's okay. that deep meditative work with Source Creator Universe, right? And um, we can talk about that and anything else, that's right? Offline. Right. <laughs> My. professional certified coach and you are just doing all kinds of things as it deals with healing modalities and we're going to be talking about that a little bit the support system and healing modalities a little bit later but first i want to kick it off with your story mm. everybody wants to hear the story we we already in please tell us about yourself your story yeah, absolutely. You know, there's so much that I could say about this, but what I'll lean into uh, today, because it is Mental Health Awareness Month, uh, is to say that the story behind my book is that I have a very multi-layered uh, background when it comes to trauma, um, complex childhood trauma. And in fact, I have eight out of 10, what's known as adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. and um, several outliers as well, because there's an expanded ACEs. So essentially what ACEs are, are trauma markers, if you will, or indicators that looks at trauma across 10 different domains. Uh, it's based on research that was done in the late 1990s by Kaiser Permanent uh, that looks at things like observing a parent being abused or um, sexual assault or growing up in, in uh, with abuse and neglect and not having your basic needs met, uh, having a caretaker become incarcerated. Uh, so there's a total of 10 of those. And then the outliers are things like um, racialized oppression, right? Living in a Black body. We know that alone uh, comes with traumatic experiences and being bullied and watching um, community violence take shape within your your respective um, communities. And so I have eight plus three when it comes to the expanded version. 
And it meant that I had a lot of challenges that I endured as an adolescent. Um, and so it wasn't until I was about 18 and after experiencing things like homelessness and substance abuse and all kinds of challenges that started to come to the forefront for me that I started to do separate myself, if you will, right? I started to put one foot in front of the other. I enrolled in school at the community college. I got a job working with young people that literally changed my life. And from that point, I found my purpose, right? And I love what you said earlier that the, the people closest to the problem are usually the people that have the greatest solutions. Right. But in order for us to find those solutions, it means that we have to heal. And in order to heal, it means that we have to be able to recognize how our past has affected us in adverse ways and it's still affecting us in some ways, preventing us from living life as fully as what we were designed to, right? And our design and our birthright is connected to things like accessing joy, finding our purpose, finding multitude of purposes, right? Because we weren't just created for one thing. Um, accessing peace and saying yes to life and having beautiful relationships and a, and a strong spiritual base and a myriad of other things. And so when I'm working with clients through um, my coaching and my consulting work, one of the things that I really, really work with them on is their life across a life wheel, right? And in around eight different dimensions or up to 12 different dimensions that are really, but eight core dimensions. Yeah. And a lot of times if we come from backgrounds of trauma and we haven't actually done our work, then we can be rest assured that in many of those areas, we're not performing at a level that we could. We're not accessing our desires at the level that we could. And in many ways, trauma is still in the driver's seat. So this, the book that I wrote was about my lived experience with eight of, of those adverse childhood experiences, the aftermath, the tumultuous things that I endured. You know, I say at best, I was a walking zombie and at worst mm. I was um, fantasizing about death, to be very honest, and had actively tried to take my life on a couple different occasions. And, and thank God I didn't succeed at it um, because I know that my life's work was very much rooted in that. So years later, um, I went, you know, I graduated, I got my bachelor's degree, and then I said, I would never go to school again. And then I got this urge to become a therapist. And I knew that becoming a therapist had to do with this painful childhood that I had that was long before we even had a lot of the universal language to even name it trauma. I just knew that I had painful things that had happened to me as a child. And I knew that's why I wanted to become a therapist. But what I didn't know, and that's why I named the book Me Too, is that I had to face the things that I hadn't faced yet because I really believed that that was my past. And so often when we come from poverty and you have poverty coupled with trauma, we're so focused on getting out of poverty that we don't even realize that we've got to take a look at some of the other things in our lives that have caused us some hardship, caused us some pain. Oh, that's um, right. and, and so about five or six years ago, that's when I really came to terms with that and started going deep in my own healing journey and using um, holistic modalities that promote the body's ability to heal itself in order to come to myself, if you will. Right. I got you, Demar. Now, the thing is, thank you for being transparent and telling your story, you know, and admitting that, you, like you said, you got to heal first. Now, as far as your new book, Me Too, and help us to understand, you know, because I'm sure there's a lot of people out here who have a story to tell. We all have our own unique story. How did you come up with the format? Like what exact, like, how did you, let's be real. How did you figure out this is going to be in this book? This is what's not going to be. In this book. Yeah, that's a great question. And I you get know this. what I mean? Real talk. Right? Like when you were it is real yeah. talk because let's be real. Our lives, all of our lives could be volume. Right. I mean, right. we can have like we can fill a room with books about our lives. Right. Um, and and so I there were a lot of ways that I knew. I mean, first and foremost, I think that God universe source is, is always guiding us. Right. And um, even I wrote about this in the book, even down to I had a. Um, a pen pal as a child. I didn't real. I didn't remember this at the age of 10. And this pen pal that I met 
a few years ago. And I'm going to answer your question, but I really want to drive home how when we decide that we want to do something, how we're being guided towards that. Now, we have to, we have to have the courage, right, to say yes to it. We have to have the wherewithal to do the work necessary to co-create what it is that we want. And so, you know, in the midst of me writing, and it was years of back and forth writing, right? And the book that I produced in December wouldn't have been the book that I wrote, you know, six years ago, long before I started to do this very deep healing work. And so in the midst of me trying to get to the finish line, I get this message via messenger. And mm-hmm. it's a woman that I had met like five years ago, essentially. My daughter was attending this um, private school in my hometown. And this program director, which I I met, I'm thinking I'm meeting this woman for the very first time. There's no familiarity whatsoever. And somehow we get connected on Facebook. And in the midst of, again, getting to this finish line, I get this message saying, did you used to be Damara Hale? And I said, yeah. I said, did, did we go to school together? And she said, well, no. She said, actually, you were my pen pal. And I saved everything you had ever written to me. Wow. So I want you to think about that, right? Like I had no recollection that I even had a pen pal. And that was God's way of saying, I'm trying to get you to the finish line. I'm trying to get yeah. you to the finish line. Now, so, you know, rewind prior to December, um, I wrote three chapters at the end. These were the practices that were most revolutionary to my healing and that are really good for all of us, no matter what kind of backgrounds we have. And that's honoring the process of grief, practicing forgiveness and abundance mindset. And Mm -hmm. so I was going through a trauma training back in September. I've done a lot of training on trauma and I was going through this training and I had this epiphany that, oh my gosh, of course I need to include a chapter on grief and forgiveness. That was in September. Wow. I released the book in December, essentially, right? So that so the, the signs came literally as I engaged in the process of writing. So I had, you know, time blacked out every day for a couple hours. I knew that was going to be the time that I, I wrote. Um, and I just started fleshing out an outline, right? And I kept building it and building it and building. It. And even the title for my book, I was at a conference, a women's conference um, in Virginia. And I was talking to a woman that I had just met. Mm-hmm. And she's the one who gifted me with the title, yeah. right? And I, and I knew that it was my title because of how it hit me right in my solar plexus area, right? That is like the truth of self. Yeah. And, and that's right below your rib cage. And I felt it. And I was like, okay, God, this is the name. This, this is what I need to name this book. So there was a lot of those moments that came to me um, in times of writing and getting clarity about, okay, this is the direction I want you to go in. This is the name of the title even down to what I decided that I wanted to change names to, right? Every African-American within my story got got an African name. And the name meaning was connected to the person and what that person meant to me and what I felt that they embodied. Every person that came from European lineage and that identified as white, they were giving, they were given Eurocentric names, right? More white names. Wow. So it's even thinking about it in that regard from a creative element. How do I tell a story that's rooted in truth about my experiences that tells the fullness of the story? And then in terms of my trauma, what how I landed on the stories connected to my trauma were really about and the aftermath and the, tr- the troubles that I endured was really rooted in the things that were most memorable for me, right? Wow. So- what had the most significant impact for me? And and then I wrote about this experience with the best recollection possible, knowing, of course, one of the things that trauma robs us from is memory, right? You don't, because the left part of the brain, which is the part of the brain that is involved in storytelling and reasoning, like how we know the beginning, the middle, the end of a story. Well, when you have a traumatic experience, you don't remember in a linear way. You remember the essence of it. You remember the feeling. You remember certain details surrounding it, but you don't remember everything. You don't remember everything, right. Think about that. Like, it's hard to write a story, period. But then when you're writing a story based on limited recollection of it and then having to still stick to truth, but use embellishment, right? Right. Um, 
to the extent that doesn't extract from the truth. So there are so many facets that one might want to consider in the process of writing, um, not to mention how you care for self in the midst of writing about your painful experiences. Wow. If you just joined us, Damara West is laying it on us. She is a author of, and let me just spell, also a therapist, and she has experienced some trauma in her past. But the thing is, right now we're talking about Me Too, a therapist's journey to heal, find liberation, and joy. Damara, you had talked about trauma, mm -hmm. and that's what I want to bring up next, because we've got about another 15 minutes or so. And I really, I, I hear it a lot. I hear that word, especially in the line of work that I do, I'm sure the line of work you do, trauma, trauma. What is trauma? And then also the impact on individuals and the community. You Absolutely. Know, we, we use it so loosely. Oh, oh, tra oh, the trauma. Oh, I had so much trauma in my childhood. Oh, I'm going through so much trauma. And it's like, what does that even mean? Yeah. So the way that we want to think about trauma is this. Um, first and foremost, 70 percent of the U.S. population has experienced at least one traumatic event that doesn't include what we call vicarious trauma. Vicarious trauma is something that we witness. Right. So. So, you know, we're in the midst of a war right now. Right. We're in the midst of, a, of witnessing a genocide from afar. That is a form of trauma. And but it might be far more in an acute right or more at the community level, knowing someone that died at the hands of gun violence. That's trauma. Right. It's vicarious right. trauma. Um, and the depths of that is going to look different depending on what your relationship was with this person um, and things of that nature. So the way that we want to think about trauma is an episode that could have happened one time or multiple times, right? So let's say that you're being physically abused. So that's one incident, but it happened multiple times, many times over. And so the way we want to think about it is, is that something that has happened to us that has literally hijacked our nervous system. It's put our nervous system on overdrive. So when we think about stress, we have normal stress that we experience, right? It could be stressful getting ready for work, getting out the door on time. The difference with that kind of stress is that eventually you're going to decompress, right? right? That stress is going to, it's going to be, re be released in some shape or form. The With trauma from our childhood, when we're talking about physical abuse or sexual abuse or being neglected or going hungry or being homeless or witnessing someone we love be incarcerated, those remnants are much deeper. Right. And those and, and because they're much deeper, it affects our body on a much deeper way. And in fact, not one major organ system in the body is not affected by trauma. Our brains, our hearts, our livers, our lungs, um, a lot of terminal illnesses essentially are connected to the traumatic experiences that we have, the unhealed trauma, right? So when we think about any way that we have been uh, impacted by the experiences that I just talked about, right? Those 10 ACEs or those five additional ones that have to do with things like bullying and um, racialized oppression and things of that nature. If we haven't looked at it and we haven't, that means we haven't healed from it. Mm -hmm. And even if we've looked at it, there's a good chance that we haven't, that we're still on the journey to healing because depending on what it is that we've endured, you know, I think about, um, the last traumatic thing that happened to me that I wrote about in my book and that literally took me out. There are times that I still move to immense sorrow in association with this thing that happened to me. Now I have done my work. I have he I have forgiven my attackers. Um, but there, I'm still grieving the parts of myself that I lost in the midst of that. Right. So the way that we know whether or not we need to address um, healing within our own life associated with the pain is, A, have we had these traumatic experiences? B, are these traumatic experiences ones that we've looked at and started to heal? And C, in some ways, in, in, in what ways, I should say, is trauma affecting our ability to build effective relationships, to find our purpose? to right. 
to build connections with other people, to take care of our vessel, this body that we've been given, which is connected to our food consumption, our movement, right? Because a lot of times even being overweight is one of the residual impacts of trauma, particularly sexual trauma, because we don't want, you know, you don't, it's the way that the body protects itself from being looked at, right? And the brain right. will do all kinds of things to protect itself, right? Um, and so, we, if we say, oh, we don't like, we'll never open ourselves up to love again. This is right. Been traumatic, traumatized. If you say, I don't like touch, unless you're neurodivergent or something like that. So there's lots of ways. If there's certain patterns that have arisen in our lives that people have, cause have consistently told us that we're difficult, right? There's a good chance that we've got some healing to do. So if, if the listeners are connecting with this at, at all. And they feel like, oh, me too. Or, oh, I thought I healed from that. And I'm being triggered by this. Then this is the invitation for you to get the support that you need to be able to heal that thing, which means right. that you're actually regulating your nervous system so that you can go on living um, in your most highest and elevate itself. And all of us are called to be able to access peace and joy. Um, and it is our birthright, but we may not know it's our birthright because in part, we're still carrying around all the baggage associated with these painful experiences that we've endured. Wow. That is a lot, of myth. Damar, you know what? I already know you're going to have to come back. And I'm going to tell you, I already, we're going to talk offline because we're just barely scratching the surface. Because just in the line of work we do at Michigan Liberation, I told you about my shirt, Michigan yeah. Black Mamas Bailout. Um, I didn't quite understand, for example, why we are working towards, you know, when I first joined the org to bail out Black women. And, you know, I later found out the black woman is is holding up the family because guess what? The black man is already incarcerated or dead, according to statistics. But I, I just now want to switch over, you know, finally to talk about the support system and the healing modalities, because, like you said, trauma is huge. I, you know, I never you'd be surprised. There's some people I'm I'm meeting, doing one on ones with. And they're like, man, I've been through. I got so much trauma and I'm just now realizing how it's affected not only me, but my family, the community. Yeah. And I just want to now have you just touch on some things as far as the support system and healing modalities, because sometimes people feel there is no hope. There is no support. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. I so appreciate this, right? Because one of the things that I promote in my work is about activating resources that help the body to heal itself, right? I believe in accessible healing. And I believe that God has given us the power to heal ourselves, to heal our minds, to heal our bodies, and even just spending time in nature. So going out in nature, grounding in the earth, right? Barefoot, just standing in grass is a very powerful way to be in the body, to be present. Spending time out in nature, particularly forested areas, the phytochemicals alone help the body to heal itself. Mm -hmm. And then when you completely unplug, you're allowing yourself to be present to the natural wonders and allowing that to exacerbate the body's ability to heal itself. Yoga is a research-based practice that helps the body do wonders when it comes to PTSD, complex childhood trauma. An uh, EMDR trained um, therapist is also very powerful. I'm gonna be, actually be trained in EMDR in September. Um, or, and or a trauma-informed coach or therapist, right? Because one of the things that people assume is that therapists are all equipped to help to support trauma recovery. We're actually not. Even though we are rigorous, rigorously trained when it comes to clinical challenges and the DSM and how to diagnose people and how to run groups and all kinds of things, in order to be adequately in tra trained in trauma and the ability to support people people that are survivors is that there has to be a deep level of analysis of trauma, right? right. You also want to be working with someone who has done their own work, right? Not saying yeah. that you have to work with a therapist that has a trauma background themselves, but you also want to make sure that regardless if they have a background or not, that they're actually doing their own work, that they are anchored in their own healing. Um, 
let's say theater, there's research that says that even just being a part of theater, um, art therapy, music therapy, just listening to the right frequencies have the ability to help the body to heal. Um, you could do a search for, you know, self-love frequency or abundance frequency or whatever it might be. And then again, the three chapters um, that I wrote about at the end of the book that, that have been uh, the practices that have been most revolutionary to me has been the ongoing honoring of grief, um, the practice of forgiveness, right? Because forgiveness is for us so that we're fully liberated, so that we have the energy and the space to be able to curate the lives that we want and we're not wasting it, spending time in um, rage or anger in association with the people that harmed us, because at the end of the day, there's nothing that we can do. It's done. And so we get to choose if we want to live well right now. And no matter who we are, no matter what we've endured, we have the opportunity to do that. And then the last thing is abundant mindset. It's amazing what we can mm -hmm. do as we center positive thinking, as we use affirmations, as we say things like, I am powerful, I am worthy, abundance is my mm -hmm. birthright, I'm a powerful co-creator, God is always protecting and guiding me. Imagine being in a space where you're consistently talking to yourself this way. Like you can't help but to receive goodness because the law of attraction in itself is one of the things that we get back. What we put it out in the world is what we get back essentially. So there's so much more that I can say about that, but those are some ways that That's I cool. use in my own life, not to mention, you know, Reiki and meditation and breath work and I could go on and on and on. And so finding the right practitioner, finding the right retreat space, right? Because communal healing is also very, very powerful, right? What we do individually is powerful, but also being in sacred space with people who are also on that healing journey. Uh, I've been in so many spaces that I've curated myself and got, gotten to see the magic that happens for people as they immerse themselves in these experiences. So those are just a few, and which is actually yeah. many, that people can really tap into their healing. Well, thank you, Demar. You know, I got one last comment or question, and I just want everybody make sure you follow Demar. She is on Instagram and Facebook at Be Well Beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put that back up. Her handle: Be Well Beautiful. Make sure you reach out to her. Not only show her some love, but also reach out to her. You know, another thing, Demar. I want to really touch on this, and then you know, I will be out, and we definitely gotta get back on this podcast. Can't wait. I can't again. wait. We just getting started, Miss Martin. You just scratching. You're listening to something. <laughs> I want to go so hard in these last two or three minutes, for real. Mm -hmm. What I found out, what you just said is the truth. It's the mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people, and I want to go back to this, the trauma, the impact on individuals and community. Do you find a lot of people are in denial about even going through trauma? Like I really yes, like sir. you did. That's why I had you defined it tomorrow because no. for real, and everybody's has different layers. I'm sure of trauma. Like one person may be over here. Who's experienced, like you said, a series of stuff, like whether it's being molested or raped or, or it happened one time, but you got some other people over here who've got some other kind of trauma, but they're in denial. Like, Oh, oh it's, no. it's nothing. It's, Yes. Do you find that you have people, first of all, before you even define it and then you try to address it, have to come out of denial of it? Well, 100 percent. Right. And and one thing that I have been talking about a lot lately, I'm, I'm recording a trauma and healing podcast series. And one of the women that we're on is um, uh, she's a restorative yoga teacher, Dr. Gail Christian, and she's written a couple books about restorative practice and how it can be used as a tool to heal Black communities, right? And right. Um, she was one of my instructors for pieces of yoga practice that I was trained in several years ago. And so, you know, when she, what she said is, is that, you know, the same neural pathway that communicates to the brain when we're in physical pain is the same one that communicates to the brain when we're in emotional pain. Mm. And yet, we have become so desensitized, right? We say things like, it's not a big deal. That Get was my past. Get over it. I should be over it. This doesn't affect me. I'm too old to be focused on this. I should be too old to be focused. We do all of these things. We, we, you still on that? Sister, still sister, come on now. And, and, and where what we have to do is we have to normalize the fact that there are, you know, one, every, I believe there's a stat that says something to the effect of that every six seconds, a child is molested in this country. 
every nine seconds, a woman is physically assaulted by her domestic partner, right? So when we think about these stats, trauma is universal. And if we believe that not us too, then we are missing the mark. If we try to minimize how our lived experiences, how our childhoods have affected us in some way, if we're not willing to look at it, as James Baldwin said, we can't heal the thing that we don't face. So if we face it, then we can have a pathway to live a better life and not just a better life for ourselves, sis, a better life for the generations to come, a better life for our communities. If we imagine if every single person looked at their past and said, oh, I'm going to look at this. I'm going to have the courage to heal from this. Imagine if we all did that. All of the problems of the world would start to cease. We would just from that place, the world would get better because we know that the folks that are doing time, particularly the folks that are doing hard. And these are people that have come from traumatic backgrounds. Yes. And there wasn't the right um, the right opportunities. Right. We didn't know we needed to heal from some from some stuff. Right. And if you don't know you have to heal from something, how can you heal from it? If you're medicating to suppress, if you're using substances because you don't want to feel or you do want to feel, right? Because this is one of the things that trauma does. It robs us from emotion. So we either try to shut it down because it's too overwhelming for us to feel it, or we try to feel something and we will do all kinds of things to feel something, right? And so healing gives us the pathway to be in tune with the fullness of our emotions, in tune with our natural design. And if we strip away all that trauma, what we get, we get somebody who's creative. We get somebody who's joyful. We get somebody who longs to be connected. We get somebody who understands what their purpose is. We get people that take care of their bodies and they use it as a vessel because they understand that they get one opportunity in life to live this life and to live it well, right? While we're in this physical form and we can, and God, universe, source, creator is simply waiting on us. We don't have to wait for anyone or anything to access healing. A lot of times when people say, oh, I can't heal myself. God, I'm waiting on God. God is waiting on us. And God is providing all kinds of pathways all the time, including this podcast to get you to a place of healing. So again, if you're resonating with any of this, reach out to me, reach out to my sister, Miss Marjan, so that you can access what you need so that your life can be better because you are meant to rise. My sister, my brother, whoever is out here listening, you are meant to rise and live life as fully as possible. Tamara, thank you for, dro- I just dropped the mic. You didn't queen, see it. Queen, queen, I, I can talk about this all day long. <laughs> I just want to thank you. We are at time, but let me tell you something. Like I've told so many guests, this is just the beginning because we realize, man, like you said, like I said at the beginning, those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. You okay. brought it and I appreciate you. I love you, Damara. I love I, you I mean, too, man, I'm so glad you're here in the state of Michigan so we can, come together and hey y'all get ready we we might be having some retreats some sessions come on come on that healing sis we got some healing to do y'all because it's you know what and i'm done with it tomorrow because we got to stop talking and we got to start we got to start doing come on you know what i mean but i thank you so much y'all tomorrow don't go nowhere but y'all i'll catch you on the next episode all right till next time beautiful people i say and you know what until next time you got to say it tomorrow Respect the roots. We got to what? Respect Back the roots. All of them. All yes. of them. Till next time, y'all. <laughs> Bye. Hold on tomorrow. <laughs> Michigan Liberation Education Fund, C3, conducts grassroots organizing, leadership development, and civic engagement activities. Michigan Liberation C4 and Michigan Liberation Action Fund, IE, are sister organizations. 